What's up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you have a fantastic Monday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is why we had Benedict Cumberbatch, Chris Pratt, and Bryce Dallas Howard in the news. And one of the main reasons right now is money. There's been this ongoing conversation and debate about equal pay in Hollywood, and Benedict Cumberbatch recently made the news because he said that male actors should refuse to do movies if their female co-stars don't make the same as them. Saying, look at your quotas, ask what women are being paid, and say, if she's not paid the same as the men, I'm not doing it. And we have Cumberbatch saying this at around the same time that it was reported that Bryce Dallas Howard is making less money than Chris Pratt for the new Jurassic World movie. And reportedly there, Pratt is making two million more. And so this whole situation spawned a very interesting debate. You had people saying that Bryce Dallas Howard deserved to get the same amount of money as Pratt. They're co-stars, they're the two main leads of the movie. Where others are arguing, no, that paycheck isn't just for the amount of time you have on that set, but also for your ability to get people to buy a ticket. Right, I think it's very easy to argue, and I mean this with no disrespect towards Bryce Dallas Howard, but I, I think that Chris Pratt is arguably a much bigger pull. Entertainers have a fluctuating market value based on their ROI, the return on investment. If a studio knows that they can pay Chris Pratt 10, 20 million dollars and that he, because he is in that movie, that it's gonna make X dollars, they can justify and pay for it. Right, like when the movie Passengers was made, Jennifer Lawrence, who was a bigger star at the time, made eight million more than Chris Pratt. They were both leads, they were co-stars. Chris Pratt actually, I believe, was on screen more, but Lawrence received the bigger payout. And when it comes to the Jurassic World situation, my personal opinion is I'm actually a little bit surprised that the pay is that close. Chris Pratt right now is generally blockbuster gold. But also a thing I want to point out, because while this has stirred up debate, this has also stirred up a lot of just horrible shit being thrown towards Bryce Dallas Howard, who at no point in this conversation has has, has played victim. Right? You had outlets covering it in a way where they were like, hey, do doesn't someone want to be angry about this? If anyone want to get really angry, we're here for it. I think in general, I think we could all be better off if we acknowledged problems, but didn't make everything a problem. And with this story, what I'd love to do is pass a question off to you as far as what your thoughts are regarding the Chris Pratt situation, the Cumberbatch situation, the situation in Hollywood in general. Because I don't actually think that there is not a problem whatsoever in Hollywood. I just don't think that the Chris Pratt situation is a representation of it. And in fact, I think using that as a representation is a pretty simplistic mindset. I think a lot of the actual problems are related to limited opportunities for uh, people of color, for women. And based off of those limited opportunities, you can see people being taken advantage of. But that said, I want to pass the question off to you because I'm genuinely interested. Then we had gambling in the news because the Supreme Court decided today that the previous ban on sports betting was unconstitutional. And I'll give you some background here. In 1992, the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act PASPA was passed. And while it did not ban sports gambling outright, instead it made it unlawful for a state to quote, sponsor, operate, advertise, promote, license, or authorize by law sports betting. And supporters said the law was passed to protect sports as a source of wholesome entertainment instead of allowing it to be corrupted by sports betting. Now that said, Nevada was grandfathered in and allowed to keep their already established sports betting along with Montana, Delaware, and Oregon who already had sports lotteries. And the act also gave a one-year grace period to pass new sports betting laws for states which had licensed casino gambling for the previous 10 years. And one of the states that qualified for that grace period was New Jersey, but they weren't able to approve sports betting during that time and instead passed it afterward, which resulted in that law being challenged by sports leagues citing PASPA and the leagues one in federal court. Then in 2014, we saw New Jersey try again, this time trying a law that would allow betting at racetracks and casinos only. That new law was then challenged with people citing PASPA. Initially, the court ruled against the state, but then Chris Christie, who was the governor at the time, challenged a law on the grounds that it violated the 10th Amendment. So the case makes its way through the courts. Eventually, it ends up in front of the Supreme Court, and today, the court just ruled in favor of New Jersey. And the majority opinion largely relied on what is known as the anti-commandeering doctrine. And that's a principle of the 10th Amendment, which says that while Congress can choose federal policies, it cannot force for state governments to enact those policies. And according to the majority opinion written by Justice Samuel Alito, the legalization of sports gambling requires an important policy choice, but the choice is not ours to make. Congress can regulate sports gambling directly, but if it elects not to do so, each state is free to act on its own. Our job is to interpret the law Congress has enacted and decide whether it is consistent with the Constitution. PASPA is not. PASPA regulates state governments' regulation of their citizens. The Constitution gives Congress no such power. Also writing about PASPA, it is as if federal officers were installed in state legislative chambers and were armed with the authority to stop legislators from voting on any offending proposals. A more direct affront to state sovereignty is not easy to imagine. And as far as the dissenting opinion, we had Ginsburg who wrote, In PASPA, Congress permissibly exercised its authority to regulate commerce by instructing states and private parties to refrain from operating sports gambling schemes. Deleting the alleged commandeering directions would free the statute to accomplish just what Congress legitimately sought to achieve, stopping sports gambling regimes while making it clear that the stoppage is attributable to federal, not 
not state action. So essentially Ginsburg's argument was certain sections of PASPA just need to be reworded and we shouldn't blow the whole thing up. But ultimately the Supreme Court has made a decision and it will be very interesting to see what Congress does or does not do here. Where does Congress stand in regards to sports betting and states' rights? And it's an interesting time for this because according to the Center for Gaming Research at the University of Nevada, it is likely that 14 states will legalize sports betting in two years and an additional 18 states will legalize sports betting within five years. That is unless Congress decides to put down its foot. I will say my personal opinion is I am all for legalizing. I think there are tons of people that want to participate in this world in a safe and regulated way. I'm also a big fan of allowing people to make their own decisions without the, the government deciding what you can or cannot do when, it, when it's a choice that affects you. But that's my personal takeaway and actually I'll pass the question off to you. What are, you, what are your thoughts about this? Do you think sports betting, gambling, it should be legal or no, it's, it's horrible. What are your reasons? I, I'd love to know yes, no, why, everything in those comments down below. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today, and today and awesome brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, a beautiful website, an online store, make it with Squarespace. It's just so incredibly easy to make a beautiful website with Squarespace's intuitive and easy to use all in one platform. You've got nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. And if you ever need help along the way, they have award-winning 24-7 customer service. So if you wanna make the smart move like many from the nation already have, you wanna start your free trial, go to squarespace.com slash fill, and when you like it, make sure you use offer code Phil for 10% off your first purchase. And the first bit of awesome today, I'm just including this because it's random. We had Ryan Reynolds promoting Deadpool 2 in South Korea by singing Annie in a unicorn costume. Then we got news that the NES Classic Edition will return to stores on June 29th. We got a trailer for the movie The House That Jack Built starring Uma Thurman and Matt Dillon. We had Life Noggin asking us, could playing music drastically change your brain? Ryan Higa giving us Fortnite the movie. We had Letitia Wright breaking down the tech in Black Panther. We also got the Rage 2 announcement trailer. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And I want to quickly update you on the situation in Hawaii. We last covered the Kilauea eruption on Monday, and since then, activity has continued. There are now reportedly 18 fissures and 37 structures have been destroyed. The governor issued a supplemental emergency proclamation, requested a presidential disaster declaration, which was granted last Friday. One of the biggest and latest updates to this story is that there may be another massive eruption right around the corner. According to the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, there has been a withdrawal of lava from the Kilauea Summit Lake, which may mean that there is an explosive eruption around the corner. The warning saying, this could generate dangerous debris very near the the crater and ash falls up to tens of miles downwind. If lava levels drop below the water table, then water will rush in, which will create steam and pressure, leading to an explosive eruption. So that's where we are as of right now, and we'll have to wait and see what happens next. And then let's talk about what is happening in Jerusalem today. So in addition to the United States opening an embassy in Jerusalem today, it's also the 70th anniversary of the founding of Israel, which is also why at the same time, Palestinians have been continuing weeks-long protests that began on March 30th along the Gaza border. Because in addition to today's anniversary, tomorrow will commemorate the 70th anniversary anniversary of what they call Nakba, or catastrophe in which hundreds of thousands of Palestinians either left or were forced from their homes in the newly formed Jewish state. So that's a general overview, but let's start with the embassy. Trump, of course, announced this move back in December 2017, referring to it as a, quote, recognition of reality. And as far as how did we get from the announcement to actually opening so fast, it's because they didn't actually have to do much physically. The United States already had a consulate general in Jerusalem, but this move adds an embassy plaque to the consulate, which makes it official. So it's mostly a symbolic move, but it's still a massive symbolic move because Israeli sovereignty over all of Jerusalem is not internationally recognized. And a little background into this situation. In 1949, an armistice was signed between Israel and Arab nations, separating Jerusalem into eastern and western parts. An area of land known as No Man's Land opened between Israel and Jordan. Since the 1967 war, Israel has occupied East Jerusalem and built many settlements in the area. It's become home to around 200,000 Jews. The area is not internationally recognized as Israel's territory, although Israel disputes this. In 1980, Israel passed a law officially declaring Jerusalem the capital. And many countries once had embassies in Jerusalem, but moved after Israel passed this law. In 1993, Israel and Palestine held peace talks in which they agreed the final status of Jerusalem was meant to be discussed at later stages of peace talks. And that final status still today has not been decided. So today at 4 p.m. local time, the United States officially opened its embassy in Jerusalem. And we saw dozens of Americans attend the ceremony. Ivanka Trump, Jared Kushner, Deputy Secretary of State John J. Sullivan, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, and more. There was a video of Donald Trump play Mnuchin and Ivanka 
Lanka unveiled the seal. We saw Kushner speak. We then saw Prime Minister Netanyahu speak. But on the other side of this, Gazans continued their protests along the Gaza-Israel border. And to give you a little context there, the Gaza Strip is a 140 square mile piece of land that borders Israel and Egypt. It is home to around 2 million people, the majority of whom are Palestinian. Gaza has been under the authority of Hamas since 2007 when a split between Fatah, the ruling Palestinian political party, and Hamas resulted in a Palestinian civil war. Israel and Egypt have also imposed a blockade on Gaza for at least a decade, restricting the entry of goods and services. Gaza suffers from extreme shortages in fuel and power. Fresh water is unsanitary and the sea is polluted with raw sewage. The medical care and education there are poor. The power can last as little as four hours per day. Many of the people there are jobless and the young people are more than frustrated. And these protests are being referred to as the Great March of Return. Many of them saying the purpose of these protests is for Palestinians to demand the right to return to villages and towns that they or their families say they were forced out of since 1948. And these protests really hit a peak today with the embassy ceremonies. We saw Israeli Air Force dropping leaflets warning Palestinians not to come near the fence separating Gaza from Israeli territory. The leaflet saying, in recent weeks, Hamas has been carrying out violence and terror against Israel, its boundaries, and the Gaza Strip. Hamas is trying to hide its many failures by endangering your lives. At the same time, Hamas is stealing your money and using it to dig tunnels at your expense. You deserve a better government and a better future. The IDF is warning you against approaching the security fence. The IDF is determined to protect Israel's citizens and sovereignty against Hamas's attempts to terrorize us under the pretense of violent riots. Do not approach the security fence and do not participate in Hamas's life-threatening farce. But even with that, we saw at least 35,000 protesting along the Gaza border in at least 12 different locations. According to the Gaza Health Ministry, 55 people have been killed by the Israeli military today with 2,700 injured, although those numbers are varying wildly. And we've seen videos and pictures of Gazans setting tires on fire, hurling fire bombs and stones. We've seen the IDF using drones to drop tear gas on protesters. We know the IDF has been using snipers. And as far as the use of this force, as far as this reaction, the IDF released statements on Twitter, saying Hamas is leading a terrorist operation under the cover of the masses throughout Gaza. According to Hamas's declaration and IDF intelligence, Hamas ultimately intends to carry out terror attacks, including a mass infiltration. Referring to the reaction as standard procedure, adding a short while ago, three terrorists attempted to place an explosive device near the security fence in Rafah under the cover of violent riots. In response, the IDF fired at the terrorists who were killed, adding over 35,000 Palestinians are currently taking part in violent riots along the security fence. The rioters are hurling firebombs and explosive devices, burning tires, throwing rocks, and attempting to ignite fires in Israeli territory. And there have been many disputes regarding the IDF saying, you know, there are 35,000 Palestinians engaging in a violent riot. I mean, we know for a fact that there are Palestinians that are throwing rocks, what appears to be explosives, many of them young men near the barrier. There's also a lot of footage that appears to show the majority of protesters are peaceful protesters. But as of right now, recording this video, that is where we are with the situation. Unfortunately, it, it is very likely that tomorrow will be worse. Because like I said, yes, today we had the, the embassy opening. It was the, the 70th anniversary of Israel being formed, but tomorrow is, a, is another more meaningful anniversary for the people that have been protesting. And that's where we're ending today's show. And remember, if you liked this video, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Make sure you ring that bell to turn on notifications. Also, if your bathroom visit isn't over, you're still trying to avoid conversations with the people around you, you want to watch yesterday's show, click or tap right there to watch that. Or if you're in the mood for something lighter, you can watch today's brand new behind the scenes vlog, click or tap right there. But to that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love you faces and I'll see you tomorrow.